Oh, there's already people on. How can there already be people on? Uh, the moderators. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's not bad, is it? No. Yeah, that's that doable. That'll work. Okay. And uh, the mic was, uh, we can bring it closer. Probably. You, no. You too know. much? I think Maybe more towards you. How about that? There you go. That's good. Okay. Hi, anybody out there? Anybody out there? We're live, I hope. I see things coming up now. Thank Hi you. from St. Louis. T T E A H. Hi, how are you? Hi, folks. Oh, one of us is going to be behind the thing. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> there's two of us here. You can see there's both uh, my wonderful friend and partner in uh, business partner in uh, Homes on Wheels and Cheap RV Living. Um, Sue Ann is here. Hi, Sue Ann. Hello, everybody. It's good to be on this side of the screen today. Sue Ann is usually a moderator. She's a super moderator. Incredible. Faster than a speeding troll. <laughs> <laughs> There's never been a troll faster than Sue Ann. Probably shouldn't say that. Now they'll all be no, out there trying. Exactly. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you this power of hate. <laughs> Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, today we are having a question and answer, and uh, the, the topic is boondocking. And my friend um, Sue Ann is an expert boondocker, and why not have uh, have her come and join us? Uh, but before we do, we'll do some announcements, and really just uh, the one we have a new program for we, meaning Homes on Wheels Alliance, has a new uh, program. Uh, hold on just a sec. Casey, am I, are we both seeing both of us good? I'm. Oh, that's not bad. That's fine. I could I turn can, it a I little. Can, I can. There. How's that go? Oh, okay. did that help any? Uh, there's a delay on this. Yeah, there's a delay oh, in okay. it. So that's that. better. That's better. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have one big announcement for Homes on Wheels Alliance, and then maybe an update. And uh, Sue Ann is the executive director, meaning she does all the work. I get all the credit. She does all the work. It's a normal male-female relationship here. Um, and so, uh, Sue Ann, why don't you tell them the new big news? Sure. Um, hi. Uh, we, uh, on July 2nd, to be exact, uh, the beginning of this month, I got an email from a nomad, and he offered to fund an emergency program for nomads uh, with $10,000. He wishes to remain anonymous and uh, just want to express how grateful we are that he is providing that uh, to our community. It's really wonderful. So we have been very busy this past month uh, putting that into action. And, uh, and that's where we are today. Today is the announcement, the launch of that program. The idea is that when a nomad is in an emergency situation, they can contact HAWA Howa will then get the information, uh, uh, verify all of, all of the emergency data, where the, like if it's a repair, where the repair is going to be made and those kinds of things, and then um, provide the funds uh, to, uh, to assist with that emergency. So we've, uh, like I said, we've spent the last month uh, setting all the, all the processes up, all the checks and balances. We've built a, a website. And I will tell you right now that website is homesonwheelsalliance.org slash nomad-emergency. Again, it's homesonwheelsalliance.org slash nomad-emergency. And there's information uh, about where to call if you have an emergency and uh, those types of things. Do you want me to keep talking? Or, uh, no, that's, okay. Uh, okay. that's the program. That's yeah, pretty that's much it. We'll cover it. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, why don't we give folks an update on uh, another Homes on Wheels Alliance. Now, Homes on Wheels Alliance is a completely separate organization, uh, but because mm -hmm. Sue Ann is the executive director and I am the president, um, and uh, we're governed by a board who makes all the ultimate decisions, uh, neither of us make the decisions. The board makes the decisions. Mm -hmm. Why don't you give us an update on the minivan? Sure. We um, finished it. We received 18 applications. We... Uh, 
reviewed those. We got it down to a top six, and currently we are at a top three applications. So at every level, we get deeper and deeper into, into um, information from the applicants, and we're about at the time now where we're going to start making phone calls and uh, getting e even more information. Um, you know, I wish we had uh, 18 mini mat vans to uh, distribute. Unfortunately, we only have one. So we're really trying to do our due diligence and do our best job to pick uh, the best pos possible candidate. Uh, in fact, I just uh, confirmed I'm going to be uh, meeting on that tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. So that's where we are with that. Very good. Well, let's do uh, one more thing. Do, are we going to talk about our next minivan build? Is it too early for that? Um, we certainly can talk about it in generality. We might as well. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got you here. <laughs> okay. We are uh, tentatively looking at our next minivan build in Pahrump, Nevada in October. Uh, the reason we need to talk about it in generalities, uh, a lot of it has to do with the weather. We don't want to be there when it's uh, sweltering hot uh, because we will have volunteers working on, on this build. So if you happen to be a volunteer, uh, have a skill that would be applicable to a build, please go to the Homes on Wheels Alliance website and fill out the volunteer form and express your interest in helping in Pahrump in October. Uh, we need carpenters, uh, people that can do solar, um, planning out the uh, layout of the build, especially if it's not the same kind of minivan that we had uh, this last June. Um, and then uh, if you are a possible recipient, if you're in need, we want to let you know that we've learned a lot from this last minivan build. And we will be, I will be re redoing the application process because we found out we uh, asked information we didn't need and we didn't ask information we did need. So, uh, but if you have applied in the past, the work that you've done is for naught. Uh, it will be applicable to the new application, but just to let you know that you will need to go back in and um, provide probably some additional information. Okay, very good. Um, this is the power of tribe, of community. Yes. So individually, we can't do any of this, you know, really very effectively. But together, uh, a person who had some, came into some extra money, said, I'm going to help and gave $10,000. Uh, and that's going to help uh, just many, many, many people. And, um, you know, we had a donor who donated the amount for a minivan. And then a bunch of you went to Amazon and bought the individual parts and pieces. And so together, we can really do an amazing amount. And single-handedly, we cannot. So uh, the, the, that's the power of we versus I. You have to have I. I is, we're not ever opposed to I, but... We are way too opposed to we in this country. It's a uh, it's a good thing to work together. Okay, uh, so I think that's probably all the announcements uh, that I know of. So we're going to just go ahead and jump into uh, boondocking questions and answers. In fact, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn these into just regular videos. So now I'm going to do an intro to a regular video, and then we'll go on and answer your questions. So uh, write in your questions. We need more. We have a few already to jumpstart us, but we need your questions on boondocking. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do an intro. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to my next video. Today, my good friend Sue Ann and I, who are business partners and uh, in all of our my activities, um, are answering questions on boondocking. I've been doing it uh, for a very long, 11 years, and You've been doing it for eight, nine? Uh, nine years. Nine years. Well, well, it's got we, all the... Ten years. Ten years. Um, of course, as soon as we start the video, live feed, the wind comes up. So we're using a, um, a... We'll pass the mic back and forth, and I'll try to make sure I always pass it away. You know how it is with me and mics. Give me a mic. Don't <laughs> You never get it back. Okay, the first question is from Carolyn C., uh, and this might be one you can answer better. Uh, she asks, boondocking in the eastern U.S. can be particularly challenging. If you have a words of wisdom, that might be helpful. Uh, my first answer for anywhere is always freecampsites.net, but there are other good websites. Um, and in the west, in the east, you need to expand your search to state parks, state forests, um, 
to uh, Corps of Engineers land. There's a lot of that. A lot of it has free camping. Um, and there's also a lot of state wildlife land that is available. Uh, so you just have to expand your search. Also, there's, uh, oh, I forgot the name of that. So uh, you got to be pretty creative uh, on the East Coast. And I think there, and in some ways, there are more options than on in the West Coast. Because in the West, it's pretty much just Forest Service and BLM. That's all, there's so much that that's all you have to do. Uh, but there, I would just say the big thing is use the regular websites and expand your search options. options. So, Ann? Um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. I've not used it, but I believe there's a water district in Florida that yes. you can uh, find free boot knocking. So um, it really is a matter of uh, doing some research. Like Bob said, freecampsites.net. Um, I did see a, a question scroll through, and it's probably a very uh, basic question we need to ask or answer, and that is, what is boondocking? Boondocking is camping without any amenities. Typically, that means uh, no water, no electricity, no garbage. Some people call it dry camping. Some people, uh, if you look at National Forest Service sites, uh, they call it dispersed camping. Right. And I would just separate it from stealth, stealth parking, which we covered last week in another video. Uh, stealth parking is in a city. It's on pavement. I'm, that's how I'm going to separate them. Uh, one is in uh, developed areas. Boondocking is undeveloped areas. That's how I think about it. And that's how this video will be arranged. Undeveloped land. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Actually, a number, and I don't know how you can find out about these except I think free cramp sites. Uh, yeah, you mentioned specifically Florida. In Florida, the um, the state is divided up into water districts, water sewer and water districts, and they all have free camping permit only. And the permits just a, a, a you just go jump through the hoops. You go through their website, and so uh, and I've done it. I did it this last year just to make sure it was still in place. And I set up n numerous uh, free overnight camps and there's a lot of it and because people don't know about it yet it's pretty easy to get uh in and even in the winter when the people are down there and so to find it just go to uh florida water utility free camping or florida water utility sewer utility uh camping google that google that yeah sorry uh, just do a google search and so that will bring it up and there's southwest northwest and they're all over the place and i don't remember the names um i do have a a um on my website uh cheap rv living if you go to cheap rv living and do a search on free camping free florida camping i have a website there covering it uh, i have a blog post there covering it and uh, it gives the links. That remain, reminds me of another one. I have happened to have been in, in Ohio once, and in Ohio has something very similar. The oil, the coal companies had to reclaim the land. The state required it, and so uh, they had to return it to usable, you know, pr conditions, uh, pretty, make it pretty again. And they, and they were part of this, the state required them to open it up to camping. So there's actually a lot of free camping in beautiful places mm -hmm. uh, in Ohio. Um, and I'm not sure how you would Google search that. Try uh, uh, free camping, free camping Ohio, and hopefully it'll come up. But uh, it was there. And, and I think that's what happens. Like the utility districts in Florida, the coal, the coal uh, industry in Ohio, and you're just going to have to do the search on each state. I think any of the states with coal particularly would have a mining would have to restore that land. And often part of the deal is they have to open it up to camping. So that's something to search into. And I know Ohio in particular has that. Okay. I'll let my, no, okay. Next question. Kathleen Mendiola and Karen ask someone parks too close to my site and announces howdy neighbor. I'll come see you in a bit when I want to be left alone. And isn't that just a, just a routine issue? Um, first, you're probably count you're probably camped too close to a town. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I go far out is so that I don't. It's just less likely that someone's coming along. I think part of the thing is 
RVers think differently than no than uh, van dwellers do. They like the company. They don't think it's an imposition. They think uh, they like company. They like socializing. They think you will too. They don't think they're being rude. They don't. They're not bad, mean people. They just have a different way of thinking. And I think that's kind of true generally with most RVers. They they like the social part of RVing. Um. You pack up, you drive away. I'm sorry. That's just all you do. I, that's all I can say is you can get mad. You can fight. Uh, and 90% of the time I just pack up and drive away. It's easier when you're in a van. It's so part packing up isn't very hard, much harder if you've got a great big set setup out and it takes an hour to do to break down. But I'm, that's my, it's my only advice. Someone pulls in, uh, you, you pack up, you drive away. Anything else you want to add, Sam? You can always try talking to them and asking asking them, saying, you know, I, I really need some alone time right now. Would you mind moving? If you don't feel comfortable doing that, it would mean packing up and going away, which would be probably my default thing to do, is like, like Bob was saying. Okay. Uh, Jean and Jean, one with a G and one with a J, ask, you have always said that you follow the good weather or at least good temperatures to avoid... Hot and cold extremes, do you use specific applications or approaches as to where to move next? No, there, there is none. Um, I, I follow uh, elevation. Elevation is the key. And it, doesn't almost, it almost doesn't matter where you are in which state. Um, 7,000 feet is going to be, uh, it's three degrees. You drop every, every thousand feet you climb, you drop about three and a half degrees. So if you go up to, from sea level to 10,000 feet, you drop 31 degrees. That's going to be true everywhere in the country. Um, and so it's elevation. You just search for the elevation that you want. And it can be in, say I'm in Quartzsite and I've been there all winter and it's getting, uh, getting hot. The next place I go is Sedona. It's at 3,000 feet. It'll be 10 degrees cooler. Three, three and a half times three. Um, and when that gets too hot, I'm going to Flagstaff. Uh, because it's close, it's beautiful, it's a lot of camping, and it's at 7,000 feet, so it will be another uh, 12 degrees cooler than Sedona. And if that gets too hot and Flagstaff can get into the 90s, uh, there are places in, in Arizona where you can go and get up to 8 and 9 and 10,000. I don't know if you can get to 10,000. Mm -hmm. You can get up to 9. Um, and if that's still not, I'll go, I'll go to Leadville, I'll go to Colorado where I can get up to 10,000 easily. And more. Uh, you can actually camp it uh, more, but it's not easy. Um, so I look for elevation, and uh, I use uh, Benchmark Atlas for each state that I spend a lot of time in. And it is very good at giving elevations, and that's one of its main reasons I carry a Benchmark uh, what Road Recreation. Benchmark Recreation Atlas of all 50 states. And any state I spend time in, I got one. And that's the main reason. It will give me the elevations. And that's a, and you can always Google it. You can Google um, Elevation Prescott, Arizona. Elevation Flagstaff, Arizona. Elevation Leadville, Colorado. And you'll find out. Okay, uh, so Ann? Yeah. Um, sometimes the elevation that I'm looking for is outside of a major uh, population area. And so it's not so easy to find because I know it's significantly different from the closest one. So I use Google Earth. If you, uh, if you drill down and you put your mouse over where you want to camp, it will tell you the exact elevation, and uh, which Bob says is, is a very important in terms of uh, staying with good weather. Why don't you hold on to it and I'll ask okay. you the next question. Gregory Smith, at, oh, you can't hear me, sorry. <laughs> I guess we could pass it back and forth. Uh, Gregory Smith, I plan to solar boondock as much as possible. Is there such a thing as too much solar? The reason why I'm asking is that I'm probably buying a used late model RV and most RV manufacturers state their RVs are prepped for solar. The limiting factor would be available roof space and any flexible solar panels I can put on the ground. Um, finally, I'd like to see lithium batteries for efficiency. I'd like to use lithium batteries for efficiency, but I've been warned that lithium batteries do not operate in below freezing weather conditions. Uh, by the way, I'm a snow ski, ski bum, and that would be... Um, uh, the big issue if it didn't work below freezing. Okay, uh, Sue Ann, I'll let you take that one and I'll come in later. 
Yeah, I'm not sure exactly why I'm taking this one since I don't. Oh, you don't do even use solar. solar. <laughs> okay. okay. Why don't you take this? I'll one? take this one. Uh, yeah. Is there such a thing as too much solar? Oh no, 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 no. You get a week or two of rain, and yeah, anybody who thinks they can have too much solar will find out how very quickly how mistaken they are. Uh, yeah, if you get a week of rain, and it's not that hard to get a week of rain, even in the desert, um, you're you're out of you're out of solar. You got to go cut back, and uh, no, and then even when you get a week of rain, you'll get an, a snatch here and there of sun. So you've got two hours of sun in uh, three days, and you're going to want every watt you can get on the roof and out. And so, and you also have to think not just of summer when. You, we're producing huge amounts of power right now. Here it's July when I'm we're doing this, July 31st. Um, but you got to think about December 21st when you're the sun's low on the horizon. It doesn't it comes up late, sets early. Uh, you get some cloudy, hazy days, uh, and all of a sudden you're you can't have enough power. No, uh, most of the I I can't speak for RVs. Uh, most of them aren't putting high quality equipment in. Um, and if you're not paying much money, it's very unlikely they're putting high quality equipment in. I'd look into that before I would, or just rip it out and buy something better. And, and good quality equipment isn't even that expensive anymore, but they still cut corners and put in crap. Uh, I don't know why Maybe they don't learn or what? I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to lithium batteries in cold. I can't imagine that they don't work below freezing. You don't know. I don't. I don't have a clue. I'm I've not owned lithiums, uh, but I can't imagine that's the case. I ha I think I have heard that before. Really? Yeah. yeah I think well, that I would rule them out, to my mind. If you yeah. <clears throat> uh, if you're gonna be in below freezing ever. Well, if you live in a van, where are you gonna put them that it would always be uh, above freezing? I'm not sure. Uh, if you know out there, if you are an expert, uh, uh, write in and tell us. And Sue KC, uh, someone writes in and answers that, let us know. Um, so I don't know the answer to that because I'm not an, a lithium guy. John Chambers asks, hey, Bob, Trump has appointed a new guy to be in charge of all the BLMs. What are the chances he may sell off these areas? I want to stay in those areas after I get my rig. How difficult will he make things for RVers? Thanks, Bob. Uh, well, it, you know, uh, obviously, uh, President Trump uh, wants to sell and, and give away all the land he can. I think he's made that fairly clear. It's really a hard thing to sell land. Most of what he's accomplished is things that were already in the works. He speeded them up. Uh, the big thing, the biggest thing he did so far was bear, bear ears. And I think he, he he reversed an executive order. That's something he probably has the, 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 the capacity to do. The thing to understand about all, it's a bureaucracy. The BLM is just a big bureaucracy, like all parts of the federal government. There are lots of rules and regulations and red tape. You cannot sell a piece of land, just decide one day I'm going to sell this and it's gone. It takes, there are a long, hard process. I believe it's highly unlikely that any a significant a uh, portion of current BLM land will be lost uh, before 2020. And, and of course, who knows what will happen after 2020? No one knows. Um, I think it's highly unlikely. It's just hard to do anything with federal land. There are EPA, there are uh, environmental statements, there are lawsuits, on and on. I think, I think we're not in any immediate risk. I think if he comes in for four more years, we will be. I mean, he's made it clear he wants to turn all the land he can over to the states who will then sell it off and do anything to make a dollar out of it. The states will do anything they can to make a dollar off of that land. Uh, some won't, but most will. Uh, they need the money, and so that's how they're going to get it. Uh, but I don't think there's any significant risk at this point just because of its its uh, this really intricate bureaucracy and getting rid of be of land uh is is a hard thing to do any comment no uh, so i don't think i think no there's not any real risk at this point given a second term uh depends on how the politics land uh yeah yeah there might be some risks <clears throat> good reason for you all to go out and vote for whatever's important to you uh 
Deanna, is it normal to park with a bunch of others and have several hours of a day spent with Well, there's no normal, of course. Um, it would not be the... It, it, it's just all up to you. I can't answer that in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, there are a lot of people who are really social. They camp together. They boondock together. They do. They travel in groups together. That's really normal for them. Um, it, that's it would, what the caravans are all about. That's what the caravans are all about. All those folks want to be with people. Um, it would be abnormal for me, but it would be perfectly normal for another person. That's all I can tell you. And uh, what's normal for one is abnormal for another. Anything else you should Nothing add yet. about that? No. Uh, yeah, it's just... Uh, now, for me, it wouldn't be abnormal to park with others and not hardly talk to them at all. But that's just me, and it would be abnormal for you, maybe. Okay, Linda, could you discuss approaches or suggestions to driving on off-road terrain, such as rocky desert, soil, sand, vegetation, uneven pavement, and shoulders? As a newbie, this was a challenge during the last RTR in caravans. My vehicle didn't have great clearance, scraped the rocks. For boondocking, what minimal clearances should we look for in a car or van? Which vehicle models might be better than others? Actually, I have an... I have a world-renowned expert on uh, <laughs> camping with an absolute minimum clearance vehicle, and so I'm going to turn this over to her. Then I'll make my comments. Uh, Sue Ann, uh, you don't have you have like two or three feet of clearance yeah. on your Prius. <laughs> yeah, okay. maybe more. Maybe more. <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't know that I uh, have uh, since I began this lifestyle, I've been in a Prius, and um, I don't know where even to start. I think um, one of the things that people don't realize is that driving the back roads when it's rutted or rocky is actually a skill. It's, it's not something that, that comes naturally. And um, you have to really pick and choose your path, if you will, where you're going to place your tires. So it's something to practice. So that's probably number one is um, if you've been in the back road and you you find yourself uh, in front of you with a rutted road where people with higher clearance have driven where their tires are is deeper than like the center part. What you do when you don't have a high clearance vehicle is you put your tires on the hump in the middle and on to the side of one of where uh, the ruts are so that you're actually driving over a rut as opposed to placing your tire in the rut. That's probably a really key one. The same thing uh, with rocks. Uh, if there's a big rock in the way, and if it's uh, safe for your tires, drive on the rock as opposed to over it. Uh, the other thing that I've done, um, because I had had plans to be on some uh, many thousands of miles of gravel roads, is I actually upgraded my tires, or downgraded, depending on how you want to look at it, to light truck like truck tires, it has uh, unfortunately decreased my gas mileage by 20%. But uh, that is uh, something else that you can do as a nomad if you plan to be in the back roads. Probably the last piece of information or recommendation I would give you is don't be afraid to turn around or back up. If you come to a place that's sandy or muddy or just it doesn't look safe for you to drive, don't drive it. Back up, turn around, go back the other way. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing to realize is that it is primarily a skill, and it's a skill you just pick up by doing it a lot. Um, uh, so uh, the 4x4 crawl, uh, crowd calls it picking a line, and so you look it over and you see, I'm going to put my, you know, you've you got a pretty good idea in your mind, the width of your two, tire, your two sets of tires. You know, so you say, I'm going to pick this line, and I'm going to put this tire on this spot, and this tire on this spot, and then that way I can avoid a deep rut or I can avoid a big hump uh, or I can put the big hump where it won't do any damage. So you pick the line through the area and you just have to come to a stop, get out and walk it. Uh, yeah, I can do this and, and, and pick my line. And having, if there's two of you, have some, we did this once. We did. We right. had to get her Prius into a place uh, where we were sure it would drag. Mm -hmm. 
And so I got out and walked along beside her. And <laughs> I mean, it was this close, uh, but you got there. Right. I did get there. It was a very cool camping spot too. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, it was in the Sierras on a big slab of granite. Uh, and, and I can testify that Sue has taken that Prius things I never, ever would have guessed. It's just time and patience and looking it over. Um, I'd say have a certain amount of uh, recovery gear and know how to use it. Uh, you are now carrying the orange things. The you carrying some of those now? I, I do. Okay. I do. And then I, I have a, um, I carry, I can't remember what they're called. Uh, they have little nubs on them that if you get stuck in sand, uh, you can put them under your tires so it gives you traction. Uh, I know that if uh, I can uh, deflate my tires a little bit and it'll give me more traction and so I carry an air compressor to re-inflate them. Um, I also have a tow package through a uh, spot that will come out on into the backcountry and rescue me should I need it. Thankfully, I haven't used it in my 10 years, but I have it and I would use it and I wouldn't let my pride get in the way. Yes. Yeah. So those are all some really good ideas. Very, very good ideas. Uh, the thing is, uh, what I bought, I bought one of these, it's a or long orange plastic thing, and I've used it numerous times, and it's gotten me out. I think it's called Instant Tow Truck, the one that I have. That's it. That's the, you go to Amazon and look up Instant Tow Truck, and uh, and it came up. And airing down your tires is absolutely crucial, and having then a compressor to air them back up. Okay. Uh, I think, Sue Ann, I mean, KC, we must have more questions here. Card yeah, number two. Okay, maximalist minibus asks regarding running AC off of solar. I've been trying to factual the startup power for that Frigidaire, the 450 watt one. Is that the startup? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. I know we started it on a 900 watt uh, generator. Um, my friend um, Jim in Denver has a, one of the the Sportsman. I think it's a 900 watt the generator and it would start it so it's not normally motors double uh, draw double so i'd figure 900 watts you'd need a big inverter um so you'd need like a 1500 watt inverter uh i think if you have the big enough inverter in the battery bank it would have no problem getting it started and then you the you wouldn't have any problem keeping it running either the key thing is just having a big enough inverter to start it okay uh it's a little bit off topic but i'll, I'll answer whenever i can denise asks what do you do if someone partner died, suddenly dies out of state while boondocking? Um, <clears throat> well, I personally, uh, I always make sure I have internet. I'm rarely without internet. It's, uh, it's amazing. I have Verizon. It's amazing how many places I've had Verizon, really places I never would have guessed. Uh, and I also have uh, AT&T, and they're really, really good as well. Um, so I almost always have communications. Uh, I make sure I have communications or I go somewhere else where I do. And then uh, you're, you're going you're gonna, to uh, either drive home or you're going to park the rig and you're going to fly home. Uh, if you have a family emergency, I don't, there's not really, you know, what, if you're out traveling and you have a family emergency, that's what you do. You either drive home or you fly home. And I don't know that... Uh, I mean that's just what that's just what happens. Any anything to add to that? Nothing. Yeah. Sorry, we don't have any. You know, just common. I think this is common sense. Uh, Vesta Moon asks, "How can you be sure the site you pick is a proper site for boondocking?" Uh, well, it's here's here's my rule of thumb. If you're on BLM or National Forest land, the obligation is on them to sign it if it's not open to dispersed camping, and I've had good luck with that policy. Uh, it's up to them. Uh, that's number one. Number two is nearly all, as far as I know, all national forest land has something co available called a motor vehicle use map. The motor vehicle use map will list out all legal roads you can go on. And the, in the MVUM legend, MVUM, that's the name of this map. You can you can either go to a local ranger station or you can actually download it. You can do, um, what are we in? 
I'm not sure the national forests were in. Something in Anima. I don't remember. Say you're in the Coconino National Forest, because that's one that comes to mind. Uh, or the Rogue Rogue River National Forest. That's one that's nearby. Uh, you can Google, do a Google search on MVUM Rogue River National Forest. You'll find it. You can download it as a PDF, and then you have it. Um, or you can go to the local ranger station, and they'll have them as physical maps, paper maps inside. Uh, and then you can, when you're in the ranger station, you just ask, is it legal to camp here? And he'll say yes or no. Uh, the MVUM on the legend will either, some of them will list out exactly where you can, can camp and cannot disperse camp. Most don't. If it doesn't, if it's a legal road, you can camp on it unless it's marked otherwise. Uh, so the MVUM and let's see, what's another way? Um, what was I just thinking? Oh, a, a, you want to tell them about U.S. public lands and... Uh, and publiclands.org? Um, um, I can, or I have also some other things I want okay. to say. Okay. Why don't you tell them about that? Okay. Um, well, there's an application called U.S. Public Lands, and it's an application that cost, I think, $3, I can't remember, that you download to your phone, and it will give you a general idea of the public lands available at your location. And it's color-coded, so if it's BLM land, it's yellow, and if it's National Forest land, it's green, that kind of thing. And then the website, my go-to website is uh, publiclands.org, and this is a website that I go to on my laptop, and it is it has a uh, finer granularity than the U.S. public lands. So like when I'm scouting for caravans and I want to make sure that the location I found is is without a doubt on uh, public land as opposed to adjacent private land, I will go to publiclands.org and uh, use that website um, to look. Some other things that you might want to take into consideration is... Um, We've talked about BLM and we've talked about National Forest, but there are other public agencies, especially state agencies, that might have uh, different rules. For example, um, I've been looking at uh, uh, the Washington State Fish and Wildlife site, and they have what they call this green dot ro rule, where uh, you can only drive on ro ro roads that have been marked with uh, delineators that have a green dot, and then you can only camp within 100 feet of those roads. So go to the agency's website or give them a call and ask them um, what they would recommend. The other thing that I've been doing um, is I've been actually just going to ranger stations and asking the, the personnel that's behind the counter. I would say most of the time, they are like more than willing to even share like their secret special spots with you. Um, and they're the ones that are going to know if there's going to be internet access at that particular location. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have routinely driven by ranger stations and have not stopped. And now if I think I'm going to be camping in the area, I go ahead and stop and, you know, make friends and, and, uh, get to know them and, and ask them their expertise. And then if I just happen to be driving on a road and I know I'm in a national forest that allows camping, as Bob was saying, anywhere off that road, I tend to look for places that are not virgin. In other words, that have, show, site, show, show evidence of being used. They have a, a campfire ring or it's obvious that a vehicle has been on them. But at the same time, I try to avoid sites that show overuse. So um, use your discretion and some common sense about, um, you know, being kind to the land that we're using. Uh, very good point. Don't create new sites if it's at all possible. Well, I would just say don't create a new site. Don't ever build a new fire ring. Find an old fire ring yeah. or just don't have a fire. Yeah. And whatever you do, strictly obey the rules on fires. If it's, if, uh, if fires are forbidden, do not build a fire. Man, that's the West and is just burning down. And so do not, do not ever mess around with fires. Okay. Um, and I lost my. Okay. Uh, after uh, Nomad 757 asks, after your 14 day stay and you move 25 miles to the next spot, how long before you can return to the first spot? It varies by every national forest, by every BLM. You're going to have to find that out for your individual location. I would say most often it's, uh, I don't even know if it's true to say you can be gone two weeks and then you can return. 
uh, but it's, it's really often uh, you have to, you can have to be gone 30 days total and then you can come back and sometimes uh, some places where it's very very popular like Lone Pine I believe it's 14 days in a year um, and so you, you just have to know the rules in your area there's no way getting around it and you can Google the National Forest or the BLM office you're in and you can uh, look you can call them just you know they'll give you the Ranger district closest to you just call them and ask them it's really that simple uh, we all have free long distance on our phones. It's no big deal to call, to ask, to find out. Uh, it's easy to find out. Or you can look it up on the website. They're, the websites are, my experience with National Forest websites in particular is poor. They're really poor. You can't generally find what you want. But you can always find a phone number and call them. Anything to add? Um, I just had a recent experience that uh, finding out that one particular National Forest, and I think it was Coconino. I can't remember. It was in Arizona. Uh, allowed 14 days within every 28 days with forest wide. So it wasn't a matter of moving 25 miles. It really was removing yourself from that forest uh, for the next 14 days before you could actually go back and spend another 14 days. Yeah, it's uh, th there's no there's no broad generalization. You're going to have to learn for each area, and it's really not that hard um, to do so. Uh, how do you, Lynn Hammonds asks, how do you vote? Guys, vote if you're boondocking, just absentee. It's just like if you're traveling when you happen when the election happens, you do a uh, absentee. That's it. That's it. It's just absentee. It's no big deal. Um, oh, and you have to drive into town, or no? Most of those are mail, aren't they? Yeah. They're just mail in. Uh, you just have to find a mailbox, and there's no problem with that. Dandy Dan, how hard would it be in a Camry sedan pulling a trailer to get into boondocking spots in National Forests and BLM land? I don't think it'd be any real problem at all. Um, no problem at all. There's plenty. You, there are some you can't go to. That's the thing. If you want to go to the deepest spot, you got to have a vehicle that'll go there. But there's still you drove by tons and tons and tons to get to the deepest spot, and so I don't want to ever imply to you that you got to have a four wheel drive to go camping. You don't, you can be in an RV, RV and find plenty of places. Here's the issue. You're more likely to have the guy pull in and camp too close because you're easy to find and easy to reach. The deeper you go, the less likely you are to be disturbed. But other than that, you won't have any problem finding places you can go tons and tons. That's it. That's it. It really is. Okay. I think I have to pay change, um, cards. And card number three, uh, LK asks Bob, uh, have you both ever done the par park host thing? What's the pros and cons of this? That's kind of an off topic. Um, but all I've been, a, you've never been a campground host. I've been a campground host for four years. I loved it. Uh, good money. Uh, you are somewhere you can't spend much money. Uh, that's the main pro. I, I liked it. I liked the interactions I had with people. I went remote again. I like being remote. I don't want a lot of people around me. So I went really deep in the woods and, um, mostly I just had campers on the weekends and, uh, I enjoyed it. The, the, the big negative cleaning the toilets, <laughs> <laughs> cleaning toilets is no fun period. And, uh, on a busy July weekend and you, the campground's packed and somebody's eating something that didn't agree with him. And he runs down to the toilet really fast. And he's dropping his drawers and he sprays the whole way he's turning around. And then you really, really dislike yeah. doing the cleaning the toilet. And you know what? That guy's probably going to do it two or three times. So on a good weekend, I know if somebody's there has got a bowel problem because I'm going in there cleaning that all the time. Uh, so that's the negative. It's, but it's normally no big deal. Um, I liked it. The, I thought the money was good. You get, uh, usually it's minimum wage of the area you're in. Those are going up. So it might be 10, 11, 12, $13 an hour and you get a free campsite. So a lot to be said for it. Joyce's legacy asks, we're going on. Joyce's legacy asks, what is the key for finding boondocking sites in the national forest with adequate internet? I'm not having any success out here in Oregon and Washington. Really? I've had good success in Oregon and not in Washington, but in Oregon. Uh, thanks. Uh, you want to take that? I'll let you take that on first. If you have anything you want to add. Oops. 
so um, I I have recently finished scouting for the caravans in Oregon and Washington. So um, I I would uh, concur with you that it is a challenge, and um, there really um, there's really uh, no way except to do your research, use freecampsites.net, see what the view, reviews say, see if uh, people that have been there say they get cell service. Uh, unfortunately, I found that uh, not as accurate as I had hoped it would be. I did recently, uh, somebody shared with me a website, or excuse me, a, a phone app called Coverage, and that's with a question mark, so I guess it would be Coverage. Or something. Um, and it actually will give you uh, pretty granular information about cell service. And so uh, I wish I had had that when I was scouting for the caravans, but I didn't. Um, it, I'm sorry, there's just no easy answer. You, you go there, you see if it's there. If it's not there, you go someplace else. Okay, this is something I've been doing a lot and I've given a lot of thought to. First, almost Verizon covers almost all freeways. Yeah, it's just that simple. Uh, Verizon covers almost all freeways. So look at the freeway, find an exit that leads up to a the national forest around it. Look for a road, uh, get off on that exit, take a road up into the national forest, uh, do a Google search on there and find forest service roads where you might can camp on. Most of the times you are going up, you're going to leave the freeway, you're going to go up onto the National Forest and look down on the freeway. Uh, so that's very likely to have uh, internet because, so here's how you do that. Let me, I left one part out. As you're driving down the road, you have your phone open and you're watching. You've got good internet, look for the next, look for BLM land or National Forest land nearby. Out west, that's common. Uh, look ahead. Uh, see more national forests nearby. One of the ways I'll plan a route is to look for freeways that drive through national forests. And I know somewhere I'm going to find uh, a, an exit and a national forest road that's looking on the freeway and we'll have it. It's almost inevitable. Same thing with all major roads. Uh, so the road from um, uh, Klamath Falls to uh, Bend, there's freeway all along there. I've, I've pulled my phone out and, mm -hmm. and it's all, almost all through national forest and you can camp all over on the road from, from Klamath to Bend. I've done it. I've watched, uh, lots of camping, lots of internet. So find major roads that a lot of people drive on and there's going to be internet on it. Find a road nearby. Same thing with the town. Uh, I like sisters a lot and there is internet every a lot of sisters, maybe 5,000, 10,000, 5,000, 5, uh, there's internet, great internet at any town with 5,000 period. And so you, the best bet is if you can, I Lakeview, I, I was looking for a place to camp and I found Lakeview, which is a little town, even smaller, maybe about the same size of sisters, but it's surrounded by mountains. And so I just knew that if I went to Lakeview, Lakeview would have fast 4G and the towers would be in one of the mountains around it. And so I knew that if I could climb up on any one of those mountains nearby and look down at Lakeview, I would have great internet and great camping. And that's exactly what happened. I just got out, uh, did a Google uh, map, a satellite, and found a road that went up and that looked down on um, Lakeview. And it was gorgeous and it had great internet and I was happy as a clam. So that's the key. Think about where internet will be. Now, if it's a remote road in the middle of nowhere, it won't have. And that's, boy, Nevada. You've looked in Nevada like I have. Mm -hmm. Nevada is the big blank space with no internet. And even the major roads probably won't have it. Um, but in Oregon, any, any large populated state, uh, the, the major roads are all going to have it. And you just look for national forests nearby camp in those. Or it, just the opposite, in the winter, Look for BLM land near a freeway, and you're going to find a, almost always if you find an exit, and then you take and the exit has internet, internet because you're driving around the road down the road looking at your phone, you get off on that internet with the, uh, that interstate exit with, um, with internet, you can almost certainly drive off into the distance, find BLM land and camp on it. So that's my advice. 
on uh, next question. I covered that pretty well. Ten minutes? Yeah, we got ten minutes. Better hurry up. Okay, we have quite a few questions. Uh, okay, number three. Mary Ann, when you boondock on BLM land, do you register anywhere and it is at all free? Uh, yes, uh, yes and no. Uh, almost, almost never do you have to register on BLM land. There are a few places where it's either so busy you have to register or it's so risky that you have to register two places that I know of on BLM land. You've had to register is all around BLM because it's so uh, all around quartzite because it's so busy and grand staircase Escalante because it's this huge open, no internet space and it's dangerous. And they ask you to get a permit. It's in both cases. It's um, free and automatic. It, they just want you to have it. Uh, but that's really, really rare. Same. That's about about it. Are, do you know of any other places you have to get a permit? On BLM land? I think there's a place in Yuma that you also have to. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some of the rec special recreation areas. Yeah. Like the National Forest out around uh, Phoenix, the Tonto. Mm -hmm. That has a special recreation permit. Uh, on, on, I'm also thinking of a place of National Forest around Salt Lake City. Uh, where you have to get a permit where it's just so close to really busy areas. Uh, Phoenix, Salt Lake city, Yuma is as a busy areas where there are a lot of people, um, that you have to get a permit. It's unusual. Uh, and it's, you don't pay unless it's a campground and at the campground, it'll be really stated specifically. Mm -hmm. This is a campground fee area. That's the key. There will be a sign saying this is a fee area. If there's no sign saying fee area, it's hard for them to make you pay because they got to warn you. Uh, Joyce Hippie. Hip. Joyce. What are, I'm sorry, Joyce. Uh, can you boondock and leave for a job when you use a travel trailer? I'm worried about theft. Do uh, you want to answer that? Any particular? No. Uh, I don't want to dominate. Uh, I usually do. I'm a dominator. Uh, can you boondock and leave for a job when you use a travel trailer? If that's illegal. That's called residence, and it's illegal. If the if the uh, ranger spots you doing it, he'll give you a ticket. Um, um, so be aware of that. Number one, uh, that's your first concern. That uh, that's called residence. Even if you're obeying the 14 day, he stops and find out you're working. Uh, he will probably cite you. Depends uh, depends on the particular forest. Depends on how he's feeling that day. There is a severe risk that you're breaking the law and you will get a ticket. Uh, worried about theft. You can, you can secure it well enough that you don't have to worry about theft. Uh, the problem is people are going to see a pattern people and you're going to have a pattern because you're going to a job every day. People see a pattern. Uh, I was a national, I was in a campground host in a national forest on a main road and they could see it from my camp, from the road, um, pretty busy road. And someone noticed my pattern and stole stuff out of my campsite. I was in my van. My van was gone, but they knew I was gone every Thursday and Friday or whatever. It wasn't Thursday, Friday. It was probably Tuesday, Wednesday. I was gone every Tuesday, Wednesday, and I left a few things. Someone went in and stole some stuff. Um, you'll notice a pattern, and you're real at risk, yes. So nothing, you don't want to. You know. yep. Candace Galloway, how have the fire summers affected BLM camping in the West? BLM, not hardly at all because BLM is desert. Almost always, it hugely impacts the uh, uh, national forest. Do you want to comment on fires in the national forest? Um, well, Just yeah. Um, when we were here at the end of June, the uh, national forest folks uh, started posting signs about uh, not having fires. So I, it just behooves us, you know, to follow follow the uh, what they're asking us to do and, and not have fires. As far as where I've been camping in Washington, Oregon, I've had no impact, fire impact. Have you had any fire impact here? Just the smoke. Okay. The smoke's and, unpleasant, but no. Yeah. That's all. I haven't even had smoke that I know of. Yeah. Well, last year. The, last the, year it was. Yeah. This year hasn't been much of a fire season so far, so it has an impact. No, not even, you know, we're, I've not been anywhere where there was, well, when I was a sister's, there was some smoke, but it wasn't an issue. Um, no, it hasn't impacted me very much other than the smoke. 
Uh, Elaine H., do you get prescriptions in the mail? What about doctor visits to renew scripts? Um, I have a, vi maybe I haven't published that video. I haven't published that video. Um, you want to cover that? Do you want me to? I can tell you, tell them what I do. Okay. Okay. Um, now that I'm full time, uh, when I was part time, uh, a, a part time nomad, I would simply get my refills when I went back to my sticks and bricks. Now that I'm full time, um, I still have the same scripts. Uh, and I do see my physician in my state of res my my place of residence, um, but the the prescriptions I have, thankfully, I can get them filled in Mexico, and Los Agadones. So I simply uh, work it so that I can I can save funds and and get those prescriptions filled in Mexico for a fraction of the of the cost. Yeah, I do the same. I get all my prescriptions in, out of Mexico, uh, have been for the last nine years, have not had any drugs from anywhere but Mexico in the last nine years. They work perfectly. Um, uh, but if, if you don't do that, you can't do that, you don't, you're don't. you afraid to go to Mexico, you don't have a passport, whatever, uh, Walmart's everywhere, and um, they'll just transfer the subscription. And if not, Walgreen does, and, and um, uh, CVS, and all the drugstores are tied together by computers. You can get them anywhere. No big deal. Um, and uh, you have a home base. So uh, you have a home base where your doctor is, and you go past there once a year. Uh, again, that's not been an issue for me at all. Um, okay, Dean Tynan, one major concern while boondocking would be increased medical response time during a medical emergency. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it is. It's a, it's a concern. If you have uh, serious health issues, that's something for you to think about. You can boondock close to towns. Uh, you can boondock, well, we're always near Blythe. And in the winter, it's easy. BLM land is, there's a lot of BLM land near towns. Summer, it's a little harder, but not hard. We're half, we had a lady with, uh, here out at, in, outside of Klamath Falls, had, um, uh, a real medical emergency. She went in and got immediately got a pacemaker put in. She drove into town. It was half hour away. Uh, anything to add to that? Um, when we're in the desert Southwest, there's a couple of places that we are between states, sometimes in California and sometimes in Arizona. Uh, at those times, when you call 911 from your cell phone, it may go to the neighboring state's 911 service. So if you know that there is a possibility that you need emergency services, I would uh, contact, I would find the uh, dispatch number for the state that you're in, for the county that you're in, and uh, keep that handy. So in lieu of calling 911, you would call that dispatch number and let them know where you are. That would be the, um, we had a couple situations with the caravans where we found that to be the case. Uh, really, it's no big deal. I think, I think, have we ever been more, I don't think I'm ever more than half an hour away from, from emergency medical response. Um, maybe I have been, but not very often. And I always have internet and I always have cell. So if that really has not been an issue. Uh, Hair Wolf. Hi, what is the best option to get internet service while boondocking, Verizon, etc.? Thank you, Billy. Uh, you want to, it's Verizon. Yeah, it's Verizon. <laughs> it's Verizon. <laughs> uh, if you can have Verizon and AT and T, you're pretty well covered. Um, but yeah, Verizon's better. All right, next uh, card. Card number four. How are we on time? Okay, we have uh, another seven questions. Uh, well, somebody probably just joined, and some have. Are, I'm okay. I'll keep answering. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, uh, Tony. McJunkins asks, hey, Bob, could you mention again what you carry in your van in case you get stuck in the road? Um, it's called a, uh, it's a long plastic thing. That, uh, two of them. Two of them, one for each tire. And uh, the particular brand we carry, and you carry the same one, mm -hmm. it's um, portable tow truck. Is it either portable or instant, something like that. Yes. Uh, go to Amazon, uh, portable tow truck. We've had a lot of pretty birds. We had a. Osprey fly in, and there's a cormorant, cormorant there, and we have, uh, I think, I don't know if that's a hawk up there, or I, I, I think know. it's a hawk. Uh, we've got a lot of bird activity. We're on the little lake again that I've been on. Um, 
And the key thing is a, uh, a compressor, air down your tires. That's the most important thing you can do. Air them down to 10, 15 pounds, depending on the weight of your vehicle. And uh, it's amazing how often that will get you out. Uh, and I think the portable tow trucks, and I always carry a, um, a strap. I got to yeah. always have a, strap. a recovery strap, recovery strap so that you can get someone to pull you out. And I've used them all and they've all worked. Kevin Ellis, why don't you discuss caravans anymore? I know meet up, but you started it. Now it seems it's never spoken about what happened. Do you want to address that? Sure. So, um, this is the first year for the caravans. And so we're learning as we're going. Uh, one of the, the hallmarks of us is, as nomads is we tend to gather together in the winter because there's so few places that I have decent weather. Um, but in the spring and the summer, we um, kind of all go our own ways because there's so many places. And But we, we thought we'd try the caravans for spring and summer. And we've been having them. They're on meetup. Uh, they're places that they've been attended. But they're not large like they were in the fall and winter. And actually, that's a good thing because the spaces aren't not that large. Um, so they're going. Uh, if you are interested, uh, go to meetup.com slash caravans, uh, and you will see the uh, current ones that are listed. And then um, uh, as as the time gets closer to the 14-day limit, we uh, list others. So they're still going. Yeah, they're just not very busy, and there's really nothing to say. Go join a caravan if you want. People write me all the time and say, Bob, I want to join others. I just write back and say, join a caravan. Um They'll, they'll go, they'll be big again come winter. They will. We'll head down, uh, they'll get to back to Pahrump probably in October. They'll probably be in Nevada starting in um, October. Yeah. Um, then we'll start to grow again. What happens is, you know, it's beautiful everywhere. Everybody goes and explores. And so it's always been that way as long as I've been a nomad. We scatter to the wind in the summer. And so they're, but they're there. They're just fine. They're doing great. Um and so, uh, but they'll grow and be big again, uh, again in the winter. That's the way it always has been. Uh, Ata tribe, where is the safe boondocking area in Southern California? Everywhere. It's just, just everywhere. As far as I know, uh, you want to take that one or. I can see where I, I like. Where do California. you go? Yeah. Um, typically in Southern California between, uh, Yuma which is at right at, it, it is in Arizona, but right at the California border and the town of El Centro right along, is that I-8? Yes. I-8. Uh, there's all kinds of BLM boondocking there. Kind of a standard place we go. In fact, we've had caravans there and that's American Girl Mine, which is uh, just uh, north of Los Agadones, Mexico, where uh, I get my prescriptions and just west of Yuma. So, Great places in Southern California. Yeah, in uh, Barstow, the area around Barstow has a just a ton of camping, lots of great camping. Um, it's all desert. That whole area is just desert, BLM land, and just just all over. I camped uh, for a long time near uh, Victorville, California. It's high desert. Uh, Victorville is a big town. Has everything you could possibly want. It has a Costco, uh, American Girl Mine, uh, Anza Borrego. Anza Borrego is a California state park. It's beautiful. Uh, I really, you know, it's great camping there. But it's just everywhere. Alabama Hills. Alabama Hills. Oh, I love Alabama Hills so much. Uh, that's uh, Lone Pine, Lone Pine, California. Uh, Ridgecrest is a town down below there. Uh, there's good camping in, um, in Death Valley. There's no internet. That's the problem. Death Valley is, you know, national park. Uh, de good camping right outside of... Um, uh, Joshua tree, uh, just, it's oh. everywhere. It's everywhere. All the desert areas and, and most of the, uh, a lot of the desert in California is lower elevation and I think is a little warmer than quartzite. Yes. I, I would say so. Uh, some of it gets more rain, I think, because it gets more of the rain that hits the coast. And of course there's San Diego. There's, uh, there's, uh, um, stealth parking. On the coast, and it's pleasant and warm there more. It's a bit challenging. It's, in San Diego. It is challenging there. But I know people who say it's impossible, and I know people who say it's so easy, it's just give. It's just easy. It's up. I don't know why that difference in range of experiences, but it's all there. Yeah, Southern California is a great place to boondock. 
cost of gas. <laughs> I'm not an account. I don't go there because of the cost of gas. That's the reason. And I think that's a good reason. Um, that's why I'm in Arizona. Uh, but other than that, it's great. Uh, Adam Ruzzo, any advice for boondocking in Canada? Do you want to? Sure. I, I'll let you address that. Um, the, my experience boondocking in Canada has been primarily on Vancouver Island. I spent uh, six weeks, I think, there, and it was wonderful. Lots of places. Um, and uh, it's been long enough. It was two summers ago. I think there was uh, day limits, like 14 day limits, but really, really, I, I was everywhere from just north of Victoria to the very tip, northern tip of the island with uh, boondocking places. Uh, there is a website, and I'm sorry, I don't recall what it is, that for British Columbia will provide places uh, that you can find uh, boondocking. And do we put comments on these that I can find that website and add it to the comment to this video? Uh, yeah, you could, with one of the uh, moderators could add it. Okay. And, and, and in the future, yes, it'll be there. Yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead and find the link to that website for British Columbia and put it in the comment section for this video. Oh, let me add that I happen to know, uh, just by pure luck, that there is tons and tons of um, boondocking in all of British Columbia in fantastically be beautiful places. And um, there's actually a book that lists them and it's still available on Amazon and uh, for the life of me I couldn't give you the title right now but if you go to Amazon and look for uh, free camping British Columbia I'm sure on Amazon it would come up look in the book category uh, and so I went through there and used this book and it's logging roads you know British Columbia has been very heavily logged and uh, over on the eastern side of British Columbia backed up against the uh, uh, Alberta border you're into um the rock uh, canadian rockies fantastically beautiful and free camping lots of free camping it's pretty busy pretty active a lot of places where you can camp right on a lake with mountains around it's really pretty uh and and beyond that i don't have any experience so i cannot comment but um i can tell you that there's tons of free crown land they call it crown land we call it national forest in in british columbia ella k bob if you both ever you can skip oh okay uh sure can uh pancake circus ask just curious can we have a prius caravan group what's your thoughts on that <laughs> being a prius person um that's a really good question. I have not had that question before. Uh, I think we may not have enough of us Prius dwellers to uh, make a whole caravan group, but certainly perhaps we can have a, a caravan group for uh, passenger cars or something along that line. That would uh, that would be great. Uh, what happens in caravans is, is people uh, uh, learn from each other. And we have a lot of tips and tricks that are specific to us passenger car, car dwellers. So. Cody joined us. Uh, we, we've actually had uh, requests for um, specific caravans, and we're open to that. Yes. We're very open to that. We have a women's caravan. We have a women's caravan. We would include it to veterans. Mm -hmm. I think we've actually had specific requests for veterans. Uh, usually what happens is we need someone to kind of... Oversee it. Contact person. Yeah. We definitely need contact people. Yeah. And so we are completely open to that. We're, what we found is in the summer, they're too small. Right. You're not going to, you know, our, most of our caravans right now are three, four, five people. Right. Right. So to narrow it down to specific groups would not work. In the winter, I would say we are completely open to having specific caravan groups. It would be up to you to make that happen. Mm -hmm. We'll work with you in every Absolutely. way we can to make that happen. Uh, so you would need to contact us at homesonwheelsalliance.org? Yes, they can uh, write uh, homesonwheelsalliance at gmail.com. And in the subject line, uh, mention that uh, that is about caravan specifically. And then in the, in the text, uh, provide your suggestion and your willingness to be our contact person. And contact person is just that, somebody that, that the 
Homes on Wheels Alliance staff can contact uh, and you can contact us. Well, it also means you have to be there. You definitely you have, have to be there, there and uh, and kind of we don't want leaders because that's a whole other ball game. But we you got to be some kind of host. I think we'll call them hosts again in this winter. You think mm, probably not. Probably not. You have to be something. You have to be a contact person. You, 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 you're basically raising your hand so that people there know that you're there to assist. Right, and stay in touch with us mm -hmm. about needs and things you want us to help you with and problems you're having, etc. Um, yeah, a lot of people are great at volunteering us to do more work. Oh, create all these extra caravans just for me. Fine. You do the work. We will cooperate with you fully because our plates are kind of full right now. Right now. Yeah. Um, and Sherry Laraid asks a very specific question and that I cannot give you any. Oh, Code, you're knocking the, um, <laughs> you're knocking the, the tripod around in there, Code. Um. Uh, ask a very specific oh bubbles we got we have two more questions uh we'll not do bubbles yet uh and i can't give you this specific an answer it says i have a honda civic what's the best sleeping place in this car do you know anything about honda I have civic no, idea. no let me throw out some general ideas uh first take out the front seat that will give you the length from the dashboard and maybe even under it the passenger oh yeah i didn't say that <laughs> the passenger seat and that may give you at least Four feet, I would think. At least, yeah. uh, do you have, if you have a trunk, d is there a pass drop down? Uh, sometimes you have a drop down so you can slide things back and forth. If so, then there's a good chance that you could put your feet in the trunk and your head where the passenger seat used to be. Um, beyond that, you're curling up in the back seat or staying in the front seat. Now, I don't. I don't know enough about civics to be able to say. No. Those are the general areas that all car owners should look at. Uh, the nasty, some nasty squirrel tried to take over, and so <laughs> Cody went over and chased him away, protecting us from the squirrels. Uh, yeah, that's just, just general areas, that I, general answers I'd give to all car dwellers. Julia McDowell, Sue Ann, in a car, do rangers of folks ever knock simply thinking something is wrong? Um, do in a car, do people are ever knock just simply thinking something's wrong? Uh, in the 10 years I've been boondocking, I've had that happen once and I was kind of up on the hill, very easy to see. And a, believe it or not, a state trooper came on, on BLM land, uh, saw me in the car. We waved at each other and he left. He didn't even get out. No knock. But yeah, if they do, I think it would almost always just be to sure you're okay. And right. if you're okay, that's, that's all it lasts. That's he'll he'll be happy and go on. Um, uh, yeah, it, 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 for the most part, I think uh, cops are really good people trying to doing a really good thing and a, a really hard thing, uh, doing the best they can with a hard job. So uh, yeah, I think most of the times you're most likely to get someone just offering help. Can I help you? Are you okay? Uh, that's all. And sometimes it's more, but and different, but not often. Okay, I think we're done. Let's do some bubbles. Bubbles. You want to dance, Sue Ann? No. <laughs> I'm not no dancing. I think we're not going to have any dancing today. Uh. Okay, there they are, folks. We'll bubbles. Oh, we, oh, we can do this. I can do that. <laughs> well, thank you all so much thank for you. uh, your, all your great questions. Uh, great questions. I hope we answered them all and, and uh, gave you ideas about you know, you can live out here for practically free. Just keep moving every 14 days, obey all the laws, and have a great, great life. I think we do. Yeah, we do. I know we I do. a great life. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. It runs an ad after a certain amount of time. I had no idea. No, I, think, I think that's what happens. Because we were on quite a while, I think. Yeah, we were on for it? hour 15. That's wow. the longest we've ever been. Uh, are we back now? Yeah. It looks like it. Now. Okay. Well, hi, guys. Well, we better quit before the ads start popping up. Sorry. I didn't know this thing would set for ads or even did ads. Uh, okay. Nice talking to you. Hope we helped. Uh, uh, let me do an outro. Uh, thanks so much for watching this video, folks. If you got anything out of it, uh, like us on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you later. How do I turn this off? Uh,